Hi, and thanks for joining us at Shushwap Climate Action. Uh, we managed to get an interview with CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Hi, Johanna. Hi, Julia. Thanks for having me. And thank you for making the time to answer a few of our members' questions about climate change. Uh, but before we get started, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I uh, am passionate about climate change, but my love for science actually started uh, in earth sciences. I did my undergrad in geophysics there. So my postgrad work was in meteorology and that eventually led me to the CBC as a meteorologist um, and, and through the science of seeing how the data is changing year to year and getting to tell those climate change stories, I get to not only be the station meteorologist, but the station scientist, which I do love. Great, yeah, great. And so I have seen many of the interviews that you do on CBC, and it's really clear that you have a pretty broad background in earth sciences like meteorology and seismology. But can you tell me what, what is it in particular that interests you about climate? I think it's because uh, climate change impacts everyone. You know, ob obviously there are, it's affecting some people greater than other people, but no matter who you are, where you live, what you do, what you're interested in, climate change is impacting everyone. And I think that's why I find such an interest in it that uh, you, you can't get away from it. And at the same time, it's sort of what brings us all together. Yeah, great. Yeah, it does bring us all together. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's start with the questions then. Okay, the first question we have is um, from one of our members. And she says, I have watched weather reports over the years and I've always wondered about the new terminology meteorologists use to report the weather. Words like polar vortex, bombogenesis, <laughs> and snowmageddon. Have these words always been used? Or have they just become more common in the last few years as our weather events become more extreme? Yes, our favorite catchphrases. I think there's a couple of reasons why these terms have become more popular. Uh, on the one hand, we are seeing these extreme weather events happen more frequently and more people are being impacted when we talk about bombogenesis and the polar vortex. You know, these, these events are happening with more frequency and we're learning more about climate change's impact on the jet stream and that's really impacting these events. But at the same time, I think our audience is getting smarter. They're, they're wanting to know the why behind the weather more and so we can use these terms more and people have an understanding. We kind of pulled out that polar vortex term, we as in the media, uh, a few years ago and since then uh, people have remembered you know it's arctic circulation we know when it drops down across the country it's going to be cold so we're sort of all learning together and at the same time coming from the newsroom we love a good catchphrase so that's part of it too <laughs> <laughs> yes and right now we are experiencing a pretty good polar vortex we're here. in the heart of the polar vortex it's true <laughs> yes it was pretty cold out there today mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question that's related, uh, same thing with El Nino and La Nina. Yes, yes. So these terms are, sl are slightly different. We have seen these natural oscillations, La Nina and, and El Nino, for centuries. And basically, it's just these large scale oscillations that originate in the Pacific waters near the equator. And the trade winds and the warming of those temperatures can sort of change the weather patterns all over the world. So we've always seen these large scale variabilities. But what climate change is doing is shifting the baselines on those. So El Nino typically meant a warmer than normal year for the world. But with climate change making the earth that much hotter, when you get an El Nino year, you're really stretching the limits of what we've seen before. And what's fascinating is uh, 2020 was not an El Nino year. It was uh, moving into a La Nina, which is typically cooler. And 2020 was one of the hottest years ever on record. Mm. So sort of scary that we're now beating those all time records at a time when we should be cooler than normal. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so our, our next question is uh, more related to our local uh, climate going on and, and weather patterns. Uh, anecdotally, it seems that the climate in the Shushwap in the last 50 years has resulted in wetter and warmer winters mm -hmm. and hotter temperatures in summer. Does the data confirm this? Absolutely. Yeah, I was looking at sort of the past uh, few decades, particularly for the Shushwap area, and 
Uh, in a way, the interior has seen the effects of climate change greater than uh, other parts of British Columbia. The north and the interior have seen those, those temperature differences. And it's not just a general warming. I mean, in general, your region has seen, uh, written down some of these numbers, have seen, has seen a temperature increase just in the past 30 years of uh, 1.4 degrees during the afternoon and 3.1 degrees for the overnight lows. And it doesn't sound like a big jump, but that's shifting the seasons. And as you said, uh, most of the snow that you're getting is now uh, coming in bigger events rather than spaced out and the seasons are shifting. So, you know, the, the spring freshet is starting earlier and more intensely and the hot, dry summers are lasting through to the fall. So yeah, it's absolutely happening. It's interesting that the data just, you know, proves that out. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just, we're not crazy. We're actually yeah. seeing this the change. Back it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, some as well, some people have reported that historically uh, Shushwap Lake used to freeze over three out of four years. Um, however, in uh, at the last time the lake was frozen solid, uh, was probably back in 1986. Wow. Um, do you believe that this is also an indication of our changing climate? Yeah, that, that's a fascinating uh, data, the 1989 number. Um, I, I, I didn't know that particularly for Shuswap Lake, but I've seen the numbers on lakes in general in North America. There's actually been a couple of recent studies looking at North America lakes and climate change, and unequivocally, they are freezing less often, and in some cases, not at all. I mean, I know here in Vancouver, you know, our local lakes have also not freezing, frozen in several decades. So this, this is definitely the new normal, and that normal continues to shift. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so here, here's another question. What's the difference? Um, like, I, I, you almost always hear people say, oh, the weather's cold. So that's not climate change. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So what is the difference <laughs> between the weather we see and climate change? Do this we is, how yeah. can we distinguish the two? Such an important question. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, weather, th the biggest difference is, uh, is time. So weather is on a, a very short time scale. It's what we're experiencing now and over the next few days, whereas climate is a much longer time frame. We're talking months, years, decades, millennia. Uh, and and in, a, in a way, you can sort of describe it as uh, weather Weather is what you um, experience on a day-to-day -day basis. It's sort of your overall mood, but climate is your personality. So while weather can change um, much more frequent, frequently on a short-term basis, uh, you, can't, you can't take one particular day and say that's indicative of the bigger picture. So it really comes down to timeframes. Weather is short-term, climate is an average over a much larger time. Yeah, great. Uh, that's a great way of explaining it. Um, so do meteorologists believe the current weather is a result of the natural cycles of the earth or do they believe it has been rapidly advanced as a result of human activity? I would say, you know, 99.9% .9 of meteorologists absolutely believe that uh, humans have caused this acceleration in warming and that, that comes down to CO2 emissions. You know, I've seen a few a few rogue meteorologists, um, you know, argue that uh, the Earth's natural variabilities play a larger role than humans, but the data is so hard to argue with. It's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting because I think meteorologists are realizing more and more that maybe it's becoming part of our duty to share uh, the, the message of climate change. And you, we, were, we were talking about the difference between weather and climate, and even though you know, uh, historically, our job as meteorologists is to talk about the weather, but the weather is being impacted so much by the changing climate. So more and more meteorologists around the world are sort of taking up arms and realizing that we need to incorporate climate change in our daily forecasts. So yes, the majority of us are absolutely on that side. Yeah, great. Yes, well, that is good because we need that. And while we're on the topic of information, uh -huh. um, misinformation and disinformation seem to circulate on social media quite a bit. How do we combat this? And have you seen a shift in how the media talks about climate change? This is a question I, I think a lot about. Um, I've absolutely seen a shift in our newsrooms. Obviously, you know, we were always supportive of getting the story of science out there, but just even in the past few five to 10 years before, you know, as, as, a, as, as a media organization, I think everyone, the media organizations around the world wanted to show both sides of every story as is our duty, but 
in the past few years, the mandate is we no longer have to talk about the other side to climate change. There is no other side. Climate change is absolutely happening and it's caused by humans. So I think that's an interesting shift that we don't have to tell the story of a climate denier because you know that's like giving, giving the stage to the flat earthers. So I think that's been a big change. And also the feedback from our audience is changing more and more with every big weather event we have that or it, that's impacting more people. We have more calls to the newsroom, more emails, more tweets asking us to talk more about the connection to climate change. And that has now surpassed the climate deniers calling and tweeting in, which to me was a huge tipping point when that happened. And it was really the back-to-back -back fire seasons in BC that I think we saw that tipping point here in BC. Yeah, those were pretty extreme for everyone. And uh, I think we all saw and felt that for yeah. sure. Um, so <laughs> while we're on the topic of deniers, uh, we do hear from a few locals who don't believe that climate is changing significantly or that some of the changes aren't related to human activities. So how do you respond to climate deniers? Oh, it's, it's such a tough one. And again, it's something that I think about a lot and you know I'm always willing to have my mind changed as far as how to talk to people who don't believe in human caused climate change. I think you have to see if that person is willing to have a discussion because sometimes it's just about taking a moment to listen to the other viewpoint. Uh, you know, maybe their livelihoods have changed or the experience that they have uh, they, they, that they have had are so different than our own that it's it's just taking a moment to listen and coming and meeting, you know, together with science uh, and, and not necessarily convincing the other person, but sometimes it's just realizing that they may believe that they're being negatively impacted, their livelihood is being negatively impacted by you know, the, the change mm -hmm. to green energy. And so it's just giving them a moment to talk about themselves. But if somebody does not want to engage, you know, if it's, if it's clear that this is a one-sided conversation, then I just don't engage. I have used the block button a few times on Twitter. I'll say that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, um, unfortunately, there are those out there. And unfortunately, you think we're all adults and we'd have that adult discussion, but sometimes not it's always. just not possible. Yeah. So here's our last question then. Uh, there, there's a lot of recent reporting about the urgency to act on climate or suffer the risk of uh, some pretty dire consequences. So do you still think there's hope to turn things around? I do. I do feel hopeful and I, you know, I know the messaging with, with, you know, the scientific reports that keep coming out is we're not doing enough fast enough. And I do believe that, but I do think there is still time for us to turn things around. And I continue to see examples of how that can happen. You know, groups like your own more and more sort of grassroots organizations uh, coming together to shine a spotlight on how climate change is impacting different communities. And I don't want to put it all on the next generation because I think we all have a responsibility, but it has just been incredible for me getting to work with students, every, everyone from elementary school students to high school to university. And they just look at it in such a different way than even my own generation. It's, it's everyone doing mm -hmm. anything is interested in being part of this. It's the artists, it's the graphic designers, it's the coders, it's the engineering. It's, you know, it, it, you don't just have to be a scientist to take up the climate change action. And I think that's been really encouraging that I think the next generation is doing it right. So I, I wanna try and support them in that. Oh, that's a great message. And uh, we'll end it there. But I want to thank you so much for being uh, here today for the interview. Really appreciate it, Johanna. So nice to talk to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks.